This is Duke University. My name is Neil Siegel, and I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Uh, for those first-year law students in the audience, I bid you a very warm welcome to law school and to Duke. Uh, we are very pleased to have you. Today's review of select recent decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court is sponsored by the program in public law. The program fosters better understanding of public institutions in the U.S., of the constitutional powers and limits within which they operate, and of the laws, legal principles, and norms that apply to the work of government officials. The program seeks to raise the visibility of public lawyering as an option for law students to pursue at some point in their careers. Uh, within Duke, the program in public law sponsors a rich array of activities. They include lunch events on important issues in public law, like this one, like the Supreme Court review of recent criminal decisions that will take place on Monday, August 29th, uh, as well as the 10-year legal retrospective on the attacks of September 11th, 2001 that will take place here at Duke on Wednesday, September 14th. Public law also sponsors academic conferences. For example, there's an upcoming conference on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act that will take place here at the law school on Friday, September 16th. Public law also hosts moot courts in cases pending before the Supreme Court of the United States, typically several times a year. And finally, public law sponsors visits to Duke, uh, to the law school, by past or present elected officials, judges, and public lawyers. Uh, public law also endeavors to reach a broader audience, uh, supporting, encouraging, and distributing public law scholarship by members of the Duke faculty, uh, and the web page, which I hope you'll check out, is designed to help lawyers, academics, students, and the public gain a richer understanding of public law and public institutions. Uh, the program is sponsored, uh, supported very generously by one of our alums, Rick Horvitz, Duke Law Class of 1978, and we're all very much indebted to Rick. Uh, today's subject is important decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court in civil cases during the October 2010 term. That is the term that ended at the end of last June. The October 2011 term will begin on the first Monday in October. And so please be on the lookout for a Supreme Court preview uh, during lunch uh, at about around that time. Uh, joining me today uh, for our panel are professors Ernie Young, Marin Levy, Stuart Benjamin, and Joseph Bloker. Uh, professors Benjamin and Bloker will talk about some of the most important First Amendment cases of the term which is appropriate because First Amendment cases in many ways dominated this term. Uh, Professor uh, Levy will talk about the court's recent Walmart decision, uh, clearly one of the most important decisions of the term, a case that many commentators view as evidencing the Roberts Court's hostility to class litigation. We'll see what our panelists think about that. And then finally, Professor Young will talk about the court's many, uh, many preemption decisions this past term, decisions with very significant implications for constitutional federalism. Uh, preemption refers to the constitutional principle grounded in Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution according to which valid federal laws trump conflicting state laws. Uh, if there's any time remaining at the end, I may a word or two, say a word or two about a decision from last term bond against the United States that appears to have nothing to do with health care, but in fact offers something for both sides in the litigation uh, over the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Bloker, well, sure, please get us started. Uh, Professor Siegel, and welcome everyone. I'm going to focus specifically on what has been called the Violent Video Games case. This is a case coming out of California um, called Entertainment Merchants Association versus Brown, which had a much better name when it was at the Ninth Circuit uh, before Jerry Brown became governor of California because it was then Entertainment Merchants Association v. Schwarzenegger with Arnold on the side uh, trying to prevent the dissemination of violent images to children. Specifically, he was <laughs> defending a California law which imposed a civil liability of up to $1,000 on anyone who, quote, sells or rents a video game that has been labeled a violent video game to a minor. So you might ask, what did California have in mind when they passed this law about violent video games? Video games have often had you know, uh, various forms of killing, killing off Koopa Troopas or whatever it was that Mario used to do. Um, games have changed, it turns out, um, from when I was a kid. 
They now, this is a quote from the district court's opinion, quote, involve shooting both armed opponents, such as police officers, and unarmed people, such as schoolgirls. Girls attacked with a shovel will beg for mercy. The player can be merciless and decapitate them. People shot in the leg will fall down and crawl. The player can then pour gasoline over them, set them on fire, and urinate on them. Other players, uh, other games involve recreation of Columbine, um, ethnic cleansing games, uh, and such, which all of which gets a bigger gasp when I talk about it with law professors um, than it did from you. But uh, <laughs> even, if you're, even if you're disgusted by this, um, there's, of course, a constitutional question, which is whether you can ban this stuff consistent with the First Amendment. Because as you know, the First Amendment limits the government's ability to ban speech uh, it does not like. The Entertainment Merchants Association argued that this ban violated the First Amendment, and the court, in a somewhat interesting um, five to two to one to one decision, agreed. The five-justice majority opinion was authored by Justice Scalia, who was joined by Justices Kennedy, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, which is an interesting lineup. Um, the concurring opinion the, was entered by Justice Alito, joined by the Chief Justice, and then Justice Thomas and Justice Breyer each entered separate dissents. And I'll say a little bit about each of those. Um, the first question that the court had to confront was, are these things speech at all? And that had, they had a pretty uh, easy time answering yes, that video games like Books like movies, like new dancing, like some kinds of computer programming, all can all qualify at least prima facie for the protection of the First Amendment, right? But there are within these various categories of speech, speech act, certain kinds of speech which don't actually get constitutional protection, even though they are speech. So libel, for example, um, fighting words, things you guys might know about, and most relevantly for this case, obscenity. Um, certain kinds of sexual speech are not protected by the First Amendment and can be banned. And California wrote a definition in its law for violent video games, um, which clearly tried to pick up on some of the terms that the court had used to define sexual obscenity. Terms, terms you may, may know from history or civics class or something about purient, purient interest and lacking artistic merit and things like that. They tried to echo that in their definition of violent video games. But the majority was not impressed. They said that this is not the same. Um, we have carved out sexual obscenity, but this kind of violent obscenity, if you will, is not something uh, which has been carved out before, um, which you might think is a little bit odd. I mean, this is something worth reflecting on, that we give maybe more protection to this really, really violent speech than we do to uh, really, really sexual speech. But it's not something that troubled um, the majority for very long. Now, of course, the Supreme Court being the Supreme Court could have carved out another exception. They could have said, well, these violent video games are a new category of unprotected speech, uh, but they weren't convinced by that either. And that actually is where the opinion gets a little more interesting, um, because California had argued, well, these things are barely worth anything, and they're extremely violent. They, 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 they cause horrible harms, specifically to children, which we can talk about in a minute, um, and they should be unprotected for that reason. And Justice Scalia, in his opinion, very specifically uh, disclaimed the, any, any, any notion of adding unprotected categories of speech based on the harm they cause. He said very specifically there needs to be a tradition limiting the category, not just that it's extremely harmful. And this becomes pretty interesting. He's tying together some cases which um, Professor Benjamin may, Benjamin may talk about, including a case from last uh, term called uh, Stevens, which involved um, what are called crush videos, people crushing animals with high heels and videotaping it is apparently a thing. Um, the court declined to create an exception for that. They declined to do it uh, again here. Justice Alito was not quite as sure. Um, so his concurring opinion shows a little bit of doubt of whether these should not be carved out. But he still thinks the law is unconstitutional, um, essentially because it's vague. It doesn't clearly enough define what counts as a violent video game. And as you will learn when you take First Amendment law from Professor Benjamin, um, vagueness is a particular concern of the First Amendment and vague laws are, are often struck down. So we agreed with the result, but not with the reasoning. The Chief Justice went along with Justice Alito. Um, but of course, you might ask, aren't these different when we're talking about minors? This is a law that applies only to people under the age of the same thing, 17 and under. Um, isn't that make it, doesn't that make it a little bit different? And again, the court said no, uh, at least not relevantly so here. Um, now, there, there was some uh, 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 constitutional precedent on California's side here, specifically a case called Ginsburg, which involved um, what the court referred to as girly magazines, um, that being magazines which have sexual content but which are not constitutionally obscene. New York had passed a law making it hard for minors to get those, and the court said that's okay. Even though it's not obscene, the fact that it's 
on its way to being obscene, and you're talking about minors, means that it's okay to, 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 to restrict their access. And so California said, we're just trying to do the same thing for violence. We're just trying to say, that, you know, they can't access violence even if adults could. The court wasn't buying that and said, no, you're trying to build a new exception, not, you know, talk about the boundaries of an existing one. Um, so the court wouldn't go along there. And this is where Justice Thomas's opinion came in. Justice Thomas had no problems whatsoever on this score. Um, because they had a very uh, clear uh, conclusion, which is that there simply is no First Amendment right for minors to be spoken to uh, without their parents' permission, uh, <laughs> which is a full stop. Uh, if, you, if, hmm? if you go that way, and I said Justice Thomas was writing for himself, um, then this is an easy case, uh, because all it's doing is restricting speech to minors. Um, and Justice Thomas, to bolster this, had a, it's a fascinating opinion to, uh, to read. I mean, I, I commend it to you. Um, you'll learn a lot about Cotton Mather and various um, framing era religious figures. Um, it's, it's a little, it's not grounded in a whole lot of doctrine, um, but Justice Thomas, to his credit, is very much the originalist who believes in originalism. And if the history says this, then um, in some sense doctrine be damned. Um, so this is a very easy case for Justice Thomas, at least after he reached that conclusion. The last dissenting opinion, I just want to say a quick word about before I um, pass things over to Professor Benjamin, uh, is Justice Breyer. So Justice Breyer is, uh, agrees that these things are covered by the First Amendment, and yet thinks that it's okay to ban them. Uh, and this is, I think, a very Breyerian opinion. Um, he looks at a lot of data. He considers the kind of um, the pros and the cons. He looks at what the legislature looked at. They had all this evidence that playing violent video games correlates with uh, violent behavior, and they had some studies and things on that point. Nothing showing causation exactly, but some stuff on correlation. And Justice Breyer, in his usual sort of defer to the legislature mode, uh, said, that was, said that was fine. That, of course, is in direct tension with what the majority was doing uh, in this case and others, which I think may be a theme that Professor Benjamin will expound on a little more. Yes, um, so, the, so the big picture for the First Amendment cases that I'll be talking particularly about, um, Brown case, Snyder versus Phelps, we'll talk about just in a second, um, and Sorrell versus IMS Health. Uh, and I, it, the big picture point I would make is that um, I think all, in all three, the majority opinion is doctrinally uninteresting, and th that fact itself is interesting. So now, with that as a teaser, now let me pick up on this point that, um, that uh, Joseph was just making about Brown. So Brown is one of these cases where the majority goes through in a very straightforward way and says, well, look, this is uh, a restriction of speech, and um, it's uh, subject to strict scrutiny um, because it's regulating speech based on its content. And so we have a certain number of hurdles that have to be overcome, and these hurdles are not overcome because you can't show, in particular, that video games cause these uh, uh, harms that you claim that you are trying to prevent, right? So the standard for strict scrutiny is you have to be narrowly tailored to address a compelling governmental interest. Compelling government interest is harms to minors, and they say, among other things, in the opinion, they say, among other things, you haven't shown harms to minors. Now, um, this is totally straightforward application of First Amendment law sort of by the numbers, you know, you can just, you know, kind of F7 on your keyboard, boom, it just goes out. Um, with, what I want to highlight to you all about in this particular case is, so indecency and obscenity are in this uh, slightly different First Amendment position. There's actually been a fair number of studies trying to correlate exposure to indecency and various kinds of antisocial behavior, and those, they have not been able to establish any correlation. There have been, by contrast, a bunch of studies showing a correlation between exposure to violent video games, or violence in general, I should say, as well as violent video games, and various kinds of antisocial behavior. And the court says those are not enough. Now, I'm not, I'm not criticizing or, or embracing the court's approach. I just want to highlight that one of these things that might mean is it may, it probably means that there is actually no way that you're going to be able to regulate violent video games, even if we actually are all reasonably confident that exposure to this violence actually causes harm. Because, like Scalia made fun of one of the studies. So they had students, um, they, they had kids, um, some of them, you know, again, you know, you said them randomly, one group randomly watches, you know, I don't know what, what sorry to say Bambi, that has violence in it. Some random, you know, I don't know what it is, and other watches violent video games, and then they give them some, um, some words to, to, um, to fill in, and one of them is E-X-P-L-O space E-D. Um, and it turns out that people who watch video games are more likely to write in exploded, and those who watch the other are more likely to write explored. 
So Scalia makes fun of this. What the hell does that have to do with anything? Right? And of course, he's right. You can't actually show any harm. But you know what? You're never going to be able to. We have laws in this country against, say, putting a thousand kids in an airlock chamber for 18 years and subjecting them to all these different stimuli and seeing what happens. So all we can ever do is studies like this. And there's a ton of them, actually, on violence. Again, there have been a, a, a ton attempted on decency, didn't find anything. There have been a ton on violence that have found that in a variety of ways, people after this exposure seem um, um, more indifferent to suffering in a variety of ways. This is all in the lab. And the court is saying, that's not enough. Now, that's a completely standard First Amendment answer. Um, now, now, to give my point about sort of what's interesting about this, and it's one that most people in most parts of the world would find somewhere between incomprehensible and insane. So we're in a position where we actually think these things really are probably at least correlated with harm. And, you know, correlation is not causation, but boy, maybe there's something here. But we're saying it's not enough. It's not enough because we have this very strict standard that we apply in the First Amendment. And this is a case, you know, showing the starch in that standard. So second case I, I want to mention, Sorrell versus um, IMS Health. This is a statute, that a Vermont statute, I want to make sure I get this right, that says, absent the prescriber's consent, that's you, absent your consent, um, prescriber identifying information may not be sold by pharmacies, may not be disclosed by them for marketing purposes, or used for marketing by pharmaceutical manufacturers, except for a few stated purposes like um, healthcare research. Of course, says. I'm particular that last exception is a problem. This is now a content-based regulation of speech. Again, we're going to go through the standard analysis. And again, on that standard analysis, we're not going to allow it. We're going to say it flunks the applicable um, uh, level of scrutiny. That one, at least, Vermont can probably try to get its way around by maybe, maybe writing a different um, statute. But what I, what I want to highlight about that is, um, in you might be forgiven for thinking, why is this speech at all? And in fact, now to pick up on something Joseph was pointing out, Justice Breyer writes separately in all three of the cases I'm going to be talking about to say the court is putting itself in needless, needless straitjackets. He refers to, uh, uh, in, in, let me see, which, in Brown he says that you're applying the, the First Amendment mechanically, which to his lights is not a good thing. Um, in Sorrell, he says, look, we should review this under the standard, applicable, uh, the standard appropriate for the review of economic regulation, not under a heightened standard appropriate for the review of um, First Amendment issues. So note the way in which the First Amendment ends up being a feast or famine kind of thing. If you can characterize the regulation as a litigant, and persuade the court, this is a regulation of speech, um, ah, ah, that's how you're going to get struck down. And if you can say it's content-based, you're in really good shape. Um, instead, if it's seen as just ordinary economic regulation, good luck. Nice knowing you have, there's no point, you're, there's almost no chance you'll win, so you can just go, you can just go home. Um, and that's a remarkable dichotomy. And again, it's a dichotomy that um, in most of the world seems hard to understand. And by the way, for a significant part of US history would have seemed hard to understand. So in that light, now let me mention the third of these cases. Um, the fact pattern that when I first mentioned it to my First Amendment students, they thought it was just another crazy hypothetical that their professor was coming up with. That you can right now Google www.godhatesfags.com and find the site of the Westboro Baptist Church. They've now branched out, by the way. God hates Islam. God hates a lot of things, it turns out, by the lights of the, of the Westboro Baptist Church. And so they have the charming practice of going and picketing at military funerals, by the way, also Michael Jackson's funerals, whatever, wherever they can get press. But they'll pick it not based on anything that the soldier did. They'll pick it because the soldier was in the army, and so they will have hold up signs saying, God hates fags, you're going to hell, um, and they will happily say repeatedly to anybody who will listen to them that this military person is in fact going to hell because he served in a US military that allows, it, it allow, in, in a country that allows homosexuality and this is an abomination. So um, in this case, they picketed by, they, by state law. They were 1,000 feet from the funeral. And the court did found that relevant. The father of the slain soldier, 
understandably upset, right? We want to punch these guys out. You're, you're walking out of your kid's funeral, and you know, now, it, admittedly, the court noted they were a ways away, but just even to know that they're there, it sufficiently bothered him. He brought suit. He brought a state tort suit, intentional infliction of emotional distress. He won. Court says, sorry, it's protected speech. So this statute, this, this uh, tort liability can't stand because this is speech on a matter of public concern. And again, very straightforward application of First Amendment doctrine. Nothing new here in any of these cases. Nothing, um, nothing new. And what I want to... Hope and, oh my goodness, I'm, 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 all right, I'll wrap it up really quickly, sorry. Um, sorry, I get excited about these things. So I just want to say quickly is... Nothing um, new here. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, you know, everything that I'm telling you is all the standard moves that lawyers and judges make all the time. These were all very straightforward opinions. To be honest, the surprise, such as it was, like in a case like Snyder versus Phelps, was that it wasn't 9-0 as a doctrinal matter because the doctrine seems like, okay, look, this is how it, how it comes out. Um, and yet, I also want to point out to you, the part of you that's not a law student might kind of say to yourself, gee, is this actually any way to run a railroad? We've got this situation where if you can get yourself into this First Amendment box, everything changes. And the government may be disabled. Because here's the thing. I, I said to you that, Cal that um, Vermont may be able to regulate some of this prescriber, but California is not going to be able to regulate video games. And now we know states cannot prevent the Westboro Baptist Church or anybody else from protesting at a funeral, at a private funeral of somebody who never did anything public in their lives. But because they are speaking on a matter of public concern, they get to go to your grandma's funeral and say, hi, your grandma's dead. Isn't that great for America? As long as they say that, isn't that great for America, they're in. And, you know, this is, a, this is doctrine that lawyers love and, you know, God bless it. It gives, gives us all jobs because, you know, we, we, but you as a citizen can think, boy, does this make any sense, especially given what outliers we are with respect to the rest of the world. All right. just, just to be clear, the court did not sign off on allowing protesters at the funeral to disturb the funeral. Correct. Right. Yeah, so it, the it, protesters were, I think, thousand about 1,000 feet, feet away, and feet they were away. complying with state law. And in fact, um, the, sol the, the dead soldier's father didn't know that it had happened until he had watched the evening news. Right. So I think if the court viewed it as a case about separating protesters <clears throat> from those who were mourning a loss, I think, they would have, I think it would have come out different. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. But right. I just want to point out. A lot of people would say, I should have the right to know that my loved ones are being honored in a particular way. You're right. He, they, they emphasize he can only see the tops of their heads. Right. right. Okay. Uh, we are now going to move from the First Amendment to a very important civil procedure decision involving class actions. Walmart. Great. Thank you. So, so let's be honest. We all know why you guys are here. This is not for the free pizza. This is not to talk about racy video games. Obviously, you're here to talk about civil procedure, the most <laughs> exciting subject that there is in law school, right? Oh, I even see some people clapping. Great. Okay. Thank you for humoring me. Okay. So, so one of the biggest cases from this term is Walmart versus Dukes. Of course, Dukes plural. This does not actually have anything to do with our law school, thank goodness. Um, and when I say biggest, um, I mean that in more ways than one. So in fact, this was actually the largest employment class action in American history. So a lot of people were, were interested in the outcome of this case. Okay, so, so what is this case about? So the named plaintiffs in this lawsuit were a few different current and, and former employees of Walmart, uh, female employees. And they had alleged that the company had discriminated against them on the basis of their sex by denying them equal pay or promotions in violation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Okay, so pretty big allegations. So who, who were these women? So one of them was a woman named Betty Dukes. Obviously, her name is in the title of the case. So she claimed that she was a greeter in one of the Walmart stores after having been demoted from being a cashier. And that when she was a greeter, there were several other men who were also greeters in the stores, and they were earning considerably more than she was at the time. Okay. Another one of these named plaintiffs was a, was a woman named Edith Arana. Um, so she worked at a Walmart store in California. She said that she had expressed interest in becoming a manager, going to management training, but had been rebuffed on that count. Okay. So the argument of these women was not, in fact, that they had experienced uh, sex discrimination on their own, but rather they were making a much larger argument. 
So the argument was that Walmart's corporate culture basically institutionalized a bias against the female employees. And specifically, they claimed that Walmart's local manager's discretion over pay and promotions exercised disproportionately in favor of men, right? And this basically led to unlawful disparate impact on the female employees of the store. And so, so now this comes the, the sort of very interesting part. They weren't obviously just bringing it, this lawsuit on behalf of themselves. They were seeking to bring this on, uh, on behalf of a class of, quote, all women employed at any Walmart domestic retail store at any time since December 26, 1998, who had been or may be subjected to Walmart's challenge pay and management track promotion policies or practices. So we're not talking about a few people. We're actually talking about 1.5 million women who are trying to be a class in this, you know. Just a few people, okay. So their complaint sought injunctive relief and declaratory relief, punitive damages, and back pay. So for those of you who are second and third years, obviously, you, you know, this is a little bit of a refresher, you know, and this is a preview of coming attractions for all of you first years. Not just anybody can get to be a class and proceed with a lawsuit, right? You actually have to be certified. And the, we have something particularly for that. We have Federal Rule Civil Procedure 23, and under 23A, you have four requirements which you have to satisfy in order to become a class. Right? So I, I see the second and third years nodding here. This is something you've learned in law school right away. So here are the four things that you need. Right? You need numerosity, commonality, typicality, and adequate representation. OK, so let's break those down for a second. What do those mean? So numerosity, that's the, the first one. That's the easiest one. Right? The point is just that you have to show you actually have a lot of people. This is why you can't just bring a, a standard lawsuit where you're joining people together. Right. 1.5 million people, that's pretty easy to show. We've got numerosity. Okay. The second one, of course, is commonality, which is you have to show that there are questions of law or fact common to the entire class. And we'll get back to that one in a minute. Right. That's going to be the really interesting one for this case. And then the final two requirements are about the relationship between the class representatives and the rest of the class. Right. So <laughs> typicality means that you have to show that the, the class representatives have issues that are typical of those who are in the rest of the class. And then the final one, of course, is this adequate representation point, that the class representatives will fairly and adequately protect the interests of the rest of the class. OK, right. So, so as I said, the, the clear question from the start of this case was, are the plaintiffs going to be able to show the commonality, you know, the point of commonality? And in particular, how can you think about talking about commonality among 1.5 million people? So the plaintiffs did something really interesting here. So they brought a lot of evidence before the district court um, of different kinds, right? So they had some anecdotal evidence. But in particular, they had statistical evidence. Um, and here's what it showed. And I'm reading this now from Justice Gin Ginsburg's dissent. So it's previewing a little bit of the outcome of this case. So, so as she said, this is what it showed. So women fill 70% of the hourly jobs in the retail stores, OK, 70%. But they make up only 33% of management employees. The higher one looks in the organization, the lower the percentage of women. Okay? The plaintiff's statistics also show that women working in the company stores are, quote, paid less than men in every region, and that the salary gap widens over time, even for men and women hired into the same jobs at the same time. Okay. So based on this evidence, the district court concluded that all four prongs of 23A had been met and certified the class. Walmart then appealed this one up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit, in a divided and bank decision, affirmed the class certification. And this was the big issue that was coming before the court. Um, and I should say, as a side note, there was a, a secondary issue that had to deal with the, the certification of the back pay claims. And the, the court actually unanimously decided that um, those claims had been improperly certi certified. But that's really kind of a, that's really in the background here. The main issue, of course, was this commonality point. So in a 5-4 decision, the court decided that the commonality prong had not, in fact, been satisfied, right? So Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion, and he was joined by the chief, and then Justices Alito, Kennedy, and Thomas. And so here's what he wrote. So when you're talking about commonality, he said, the claims must depend upon a common contention, right? So for example, the assertion of discriminatory basis on the part of the same supervisor. Okay, so he went on, here respondents wish to sue about literally millions of employment decisions at once. Without some glue holding the alleged reasons for all of those decisions together, it will be impossible to say that examination of all class members' claims for relief will produce a common answer to the crucial question of why was I disfavored? Sort of love that he wrote that in the first person, by the way, this idea that Justice Scalia, that why was I disfavored? You know, I don't think he's really being disfavored. Okay. 
<laughs> so <good>. it's favoring. <laughs> so, so what the majority concluded that you know what the plaintiffs were able to show is that Walmart did delegate discretion to its managers, right? I mean, it's clear managers had authority when it came to decisions about payment and when it came to decisions about promotion, right? But they had not identified a specific employment practice, much less one that tied all of these 1.5 million women together. Okay. So in the words of the court, merely showing that Walmart's policy of discretion has produced an overall sex-based disparity does not suffice. Okay. So Justice Ginsburg dissented, and she was joined by Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. And Justice Ginsburg argued that, in fact, there was a common issue, right? And that issue is whether Walmart's discretionary pay and promotion policies are, in fact, discriminatory. And she said, look, Walmart's delegation of discretion over pay and promotions is a policy uniform to all of the stores. Okay? The very nature of discretion is that people will exercise it in various ways. A system of delegated discretion is a practice actionable under Title VII when it produces discriminatory outcomes. So that was her take. And under her view, you know, the, the class should have been certified, would have been able to proceed, but the liberals didn't have enough votes here to carry the day. So, so obviously this was a big blow to the plaintiffs. They had been involved in this litigation for about a decade. So you can imagine they were not particularly happy with this result. Um, but there are two larger points that I just want to touch on very briefly. So as Professor Siegel alluded to in the beginning, obviously one of the key questions here is, you know, what does this mean for class action lawsuits in the future? Not surprisingly, the view is that it's going to be a lot harder now to, to bring big class actions, right? And in fact, the National Women's Law Center put out a statement right away saying that the ruling, quote, strikes a blow to those who face discrimination in the workplace to be able to join together and hold companies, especially large companies, accountable for the full range of discrimination they may be responsible for, right? So the thought is that the bigger the company, right, the more varied and decentralized its job practices, the less likely it will be now for, you know, a class action against them to move forward. And there's one other point that I want to make just very briefly. So something just to, to keep an eye on when you, when you look at cases like this is you want to be thinking about the the effects of these cases in the aggregate. And in particular, what does this say about how easy it's going to be in the future for people to come into federal court? So as some of you may know, there was a you know, famous Civ Pro case back in 2009, the Iqbal case, right? That was a case that effectively raised the pleading requirements. And a lot of people were concerned about that case at the time, saying, you know, this is keeping people out of federal court. Um, I don't think you want to make too much of only a few data points, but I think this certainly is a, a possible trend to be keeping your eye on in the future. You know, what is the Roberts Court doing when it comes to sort of basically allowing people into the court system? Thank you very much, Professor Levy. And now, Professor Young will talk about preemption. So I can't resist adding just a post note on, on class actions. The court did have a second class actions case this term, the Halliburton mm -hmm. case, which was an attempt by the Fifth Circuit to change the rules on certifying securities fraud class actions. And, and the court rejected the Fifth Circuit's effort to narrow class actions really in a way that would have made securities class actions impossible. Um, and they rejected that nine to zero. It was a, a more narrow opinion. But, but we have you know, a mixed pattern of results on those cases. So I'm going to try to do more cases than all my wimpy colleagues combined. I mean, even if you don't count the Halliburton case, I'm going to do five, count them, five <laughs> preemption cases. So preemption cases, for those of you keeping score at home, involve the interaction of federal and state law under the Supremacy Clause. Um, in most areas of law, both state governments and, federal, and the federal government have concurrent power to regulate. And that means that conflicts and, and, and clashes between the, the um, resulting legal regimes are resolved under the Supremacy Clause. And basically, state law is preempted if Congress intends to preempt it and, and, and says so or makes its intent relatively clear, or if state law conflicts in some practical way um, with federal law. And the court decides a lot of preemption cases. We had five in this term that's a little high, but three or four is typical. Um, in, in a given year at the Supreme Court. So in, in Bruzewitz versus Wyeth, the court held that the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, a, a statute that's always on everyone's lips, preempts design defect claims against vaccine manufacturers. So you can't sue if the, if the 
vaccine causes um, severe brain damage um, to, in some people. Um, Williamson versus Mazda Motor of America held that a federal safety standard permitting vehicles, uh, vehicle manufacturers to install lap-only seat belts in the middle seat of the back seat um, doesn't preempt state products liability claims that claim failing to install a lap and shoulder belt um, would be better. AT Mobility LLC versus Concepcion held that the Federal Arbitration Act preempts the states from barring class action waiver clauses in consumer contracts. Pleva versus Mensing held that federal drug regulations applicable to generic drug manufacturers directly conflict with and thus preempt state law tort claims for failure to warn. And then finally, this one is a little higher visibility. The Chamber of Commerce versus Whiting is the first Arizona immigration case, not the big one that's still coming, but this one's pretty big. And it held that the Federal Immigration Reform and Control Act did not preempt Arizona's law that suspends the business licenses of Arizona employers who employ unauthorized aliens. So one question you might ask is, what do these cases have to do with one another? And, and in fact, that's a big question in preemption cases, that is, is there a body of law that we call preemption law that, that has general principles applicable to any case raising the issue? Or should we think of these cases as immigration cases or products liability cases or arbitration cases um, and have just a, a completely different set of doctrines that, that are, are attuned to the particular statutes? And, and I think we're beginning to get a little bit of an answer to that question, whether the court thinks of these as a coherent body of law. For a long time, it pretty clearly didn't. Uh, but I think in, in the last couple of years, the courts are starting to speak about these issues more in terms of general principles applicable across statutory boundaries. Now, now, I say that, but the first point I want to make about these cases is that what the statute actually says still matters. So people complain that the court's preemption cases are incoherent, but that's unavoidable to the extent that Congress can preempt state law if it wants to. And so the ultimate question in every one of these cases is, did Congress want to? And is there a conflict that Congress would have been concerned about in the statute? And so you, know, you get these results that look you know, just absolutely arbitrary. So for instance, Williamson, the, the, the lap belt case, looks like a replay of Geyer versus American Honda Motor Corporation a few years ago in which the court says that when federal regulators gave manufacturers the option whether they wanted to put airbags in or not, that preempted state tort suits that said it, you know, that the manufacturer should be liable for failure to provide an airbag, that, that Congress meant to provide a choice, and therefore the states could not require one outcome or the other. But on the other hand, if you look closely at the lap belt regime, it becomes relatively clear, and the court, I think, argues this pretty persuasively, that federal regulators really didn't care about lap belts in the center seat. They, they just didn't have much of a view, and they were perfectly fine with state law requiring more if that's what state law wanted to do. They just weren't prepared to impose it as a federal requirement. So it makes sense, even though the, the results at, at, at first blush seem arbitrary. Pleva, for instance, looked like a, re, a, a replay of Wyeth versus Levine. Wyeth versus Levine a, a couple of years ago held that when Federal law certifies a drug as safe to market. That does not preempt subsequent products liability cases um, about failure to warn of various hazards that emerge later on. Um, in Pleva, they say that's not the rule for generic drugs. So you have a different regime for brand name drugs on the one hand and generic <coughs> drugs on the other. And that looks like, well, the you know, Wyeth was decided on a Tuesday, and today is Wednesday. Therefore, it's completely <laughs> different, right? But it turns out that the actual federal legal obligations of generic drug manufacturers are completely different from brand name drug manufacturers. The generic drug manufacturers have to give exactly the same label as the brand name drug that they are patterned after. And so they don't have the option of altering their warning on the label to make it safer. And therefore, a state tort judgment that says they should have is going to conflict pretty directly with what federal law required them to do. So I think, you know, I'm a little bit of a Pollyanna about trying to line up all the cases all the time. But I think in these, these cases, the results are making sense because the statutes actually do require different things. The second thing I want to say, though, is that the court is increasingly speaking about these cases in terms of some general principles. So Justice Thomas is increasingly articulating a strong principled position in these cases, which, on the one hand, eschews most forms of implied preemption. Um, so he's, he's anti-preemption in, in those kinds of cases. He would get rid of the doctrine of obstacle preemption entirely, 
for instance, but on the other hand is unwilling to apply a strong canon of statutory construction disfavoring preemption in express preemption cases. And, and that's based on some historical work you know, done by one of his former clerks. One could wish that other people's justices actually read their articles and occasionally cited them, and, and, but that's, you know, no, never mind. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, Justice Breyer and Sotomayor seem to have you know, a lot more room for consequentialist arguments, a lot more tolerance for implied preemption, um, and so it's a different methodology ent entirely. So the court's divided on methodology, but it seems to be thinking about these cases as a coherent body of doctrine. And then the last thing I want to say is just that these cases are really important. Everyone got excited in the 1990s and the 2000s about cases limiting Congress's power under the Commerce Clause and holding the states immune from suit under federal law under the 11th Amendment. Um, but in a recent preemption case, Justice Breyer compared the importance of those cases to the importance of the preemption cases. He says, the court has recognized the practical importance of preserving local independence, state independence, at retail by applying preemption analysis with care, statute by statute, line by line, in order to determine how best to reconcile a federal statute's language and purpose with federalism's need to preserve state autonomy. In today's world filled with legal complexity, the true test of federalist principle may lie not in the occasional effort to trim Congress's commerce power at the edges, but rather in those many statutory cases where courts interpret the mass of technical detail that is the ordinary diet of the law. Federalism is increasingly becoming the, uh, an area for real nerds, you know, not even the ones who are interested in the sexy commerce clause. You may think, well, there's something less sexy than the commerce clause. Uh, well, yes, it's called the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, <laughs> right? But it turns out that the actual boundary between state and federal power is being set by the terms of federal statutes. Congress, under current commerce clause doctrine, can regulate just about anything it wants. The interesting question is whether it has and, and how it chose to do so, and that is the question in all of these preemption cases. Thank you, Professor Young. So we do have some time. We're going to be breaking this term at, at 12.20. These events will go from, uh, excuse me, 1.20. We'll be going from 12.30 to 1.20. So let me tell you a little bit about Bond. Uh, it, this is not James Bond. Uh, it's Carol Ann Bond against the United States. It may not be a case you've heard a lot about, but it's a case that individuals who are in some way uh, involved in the health care litigation that's winding its way towards the Supreme Court are very interested in about, and it offers something for folks on each side. So let me tell you what the court held, uh, and then say a little bit about the facts and why it matters. So the holding is that a criminal defendant who's indicted on charges uh, that she violated the federal criminal law has standing to challenge the validity of the statute on constitutional federalism grounds, on the ground that the statute is beyond the scope of Congress's powers in Article I, Section 8, or else violates the Tenth Amendment. Standing refers to a general legal principle that if you don't like what the federal government is doing, and in fact if you're convinced it's illegal, you can't just go into court and sue. Right? You have to have a personal stake. You have to be injured. Uh, the government has to be causing the injury. Judicial intervention will relieve the injury. Right? Those are the requirements of constitutional standing. There's another whole doctrine of prudential standing. Uh, judicially formulated further restrictions on the ability of individuals to sue. This case involved prudential standing. Uh, there's no doubt that someone who's a criminal defendant and is subject to prosecution and incarceration has constitutional standing. Right? Carol Ann Bond in this case is injured in fact. The question is whether the court should impose further restrictions on the ability of a criminal defendant to bring a certain kind of constitutional challenge, a federalism challenge, or whether that challenge is reserved for the states themselves to bring if they want. What happened here? Well, Carol Ann Bond learned that her husband had impregnated her friend in an extramarital affair. And when she learned this, uh, she spread toxic and potentially lethal chemicals across uh, the pregnant woman's property. Uh, the victim avoided serious injury but did suffer a small burn. Uh, Bond was indicted under a federal statute in Title 18, 18 U.S.C. 229. If you see Title 18, it means the Federal Criminal Code. Uh, and this statute makes it unlawful for any person knowingly, now pay attention in case you're thinking of doing this. Uh, <laughs> it makes it unlawful for any person knowingly, quote, to develop, produce, otherwise acquire, transfer directly or indirectly, receive, stockpile, retain, own, possess, or use, or threaten to use any chemical weapon, end quote. This is not garden variety family law. 
right? This wasn't designed for this kind of situation. Uh, this was a statute passed to implement U.S. treaty obligations uh, under the 1993 Convention on the Prohibition of the Development, Production, Stockpiling, and Use of Chemical Weapons and their destruction. Uh, the petitioner here, uh, Mrs. Bond, moved to dismiss the indictment uh, as unconstitutional, as beyond Congress's enumerated powers. She argued this is not Commerce Clause legislation, right? This is not tax power or spending clause legislation. Congress needs a hook to hang its statute on, and it doesn't have one. Um, and it's a very interesting constitutional question on the merits whether uh, implementing a treaty obligation can obviate the need to satisfy Article I, Section 8. The district court denied the motion and ruled that the statute was a constitutional exercise of Congress's authority to implement a treaty. Uh, the petitioner here, Ms. Bond, entered a conditional guilty plea, meaning she pleaded guilty, but reserved her right to challenge the constitutionality of the statute on federalism grounds on appeal. And then on appeal, the Third Circuit concluded that the petitioner lacked prudential standing to pursue such a challenge. Now, with respect to that question which was presented, not the question of the constitutionality of the statute, but whether Bond has prudential standing to challenge it, the court unanimously reversed. In fact, on that question, I would suggest it's a very easy case. Uh, I, I, it seems to me that a criminal defendant who's subject to incarceration has standing, constitutional or otherwise, to challenge any federal criminal law on any constitutional grounds. It seems to me the federal government can't put people in jail um, uh, based on a con an unconstitutional statute, whether it's the Due Process Clause or uh, whether it's Congress's enumerated powers or the Tenth Amendment. Um, so the case presented an opportunity for the court to decide whether prudential standing principles which were applied by the Third Circuit uh, would bar the individual from raising a Tenth Amendment challenge that it held unanimously that it didn't. What's really interesting about this case is the majority opinion written by Justice Kennedy, uh, and in particular the love letter to federalism that he begins to write at page eight of the slip opinion. Um, completely unnecessary to decide the case. Uh, he does it at a time in which he knows the health care litigation is unfolding in federal courts around the country and on its way, uh, apparently, to the Supreme Court. Um, and does he do this because of that? Does he do that just because he can't resist writing love letters to federalism in public when the opportunity presents itself? I don't know. Uh, but he goes on and on about the relationship between federalism and liberty. He said there are multiple dynamics. It's not just about protecting the integrity of state governments from an uh, all too powerful federal government. It's about protecting the liberty of the individual. That's also a big part of what federalism is about. And part, right, a big part of the debate about the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act is whether the so-called individual mandate of the minimum coverage provision, the provision that requires individuals to obtain a certain level of health insurance co uh, coverage or pay a tax penalty, whether that's unconstitutional is beyond the scope of Congress's enumerated powers, the Commerce Clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause, the tax power. Right? And part of the argument is that Congress is regulating inactivity. Right? It's coercing people against their will to buy something they don't want to buy. And this is uh, offensive to individual liberty, um, not that it violates substantive due process, but that it's beyond the scope of Congress's enumerated powers. Defenders of the statute say, you're talking about substantive due process and liberty, whereas your challenge is actually about federalism. So there's a disconnect between what your political rhetoric is and what the actual constitutional litigation is about. Folks who are attacking the ACA can point to this Kennedy opinion and say, see, we told you so. There's an important relationship between federalism and liberty. Liberty is not just about individual rights, it's about federalism as well. At the same time, uh, those who are defending the constitutionality of the statute, the federal government and litigation, can also point to Justice Kennedy's opinion. Right, because Justice Kennedy, on my reading, doesn't say that the court's federalism jurisprudence directly vindicates individual liberty, individual rights claims, but rather it protects liberty more structurally, less directly, through distributing government power. Right? So there are different ways of protecting liberty. And it's one thing to say you protect liberty directly by, for example, buying a distinction between regulating inactivity and activity which is what those challenging the Affordable Care Act are suggesting, and saying that you protect the liberty more indirectly, more structurally, right, by distributing powers, by limiting the enumerated powers of the federal government. Let me stop there. Uh, we're just about out of time. If you're interested in health care, by all means, please do come uh, to the conference that uh, several members of this panel are going to be participating in. It's on sep September 16th, all day long, here at uh, the law school. And at least some of us will stick around uh, if you have questions and you want to ask us about anything that we talked about today. Thank you very much for coming.
produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.